Good to see you here this morning. I do want to take a second and thank uh, Pastor Brad and uh, Mark Metcalf and our facilities team. Yesterday right here, we were able to host the uh, funeral service of uh, a, a Hollywood firefighter who uh, lost his life this last week, and it was a great opportunity for us to minister to our community. It was kind of cool to look out over the auditorium and see the auditorium packed literally with firefighters and police officers and everyone, and so uh, many of you weren't able to be here, and so that's just one of the things that we do at HCC, and so Brad was the one that organized that, and so we appreciate him and his leadership so very much. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Mark chapter 14. Your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you have, uh, Mark chapter 14. We're in the midst of a brief series we're simply calling The Last 24, in which we're walking through the events that transpired in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And we were able to see The Last Supper. Um, last Sunday, we studied uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and the events that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so today, we're going to be in verses 43 through 50. So before we begin, and let me uh, remind you, you probably know this, and maybe test your knowledge just a little bit, but, but history is filled with treacherous individuals who committed horrendous acts of, uh, of betrayal, of cruelty, and of murder. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put a couple of faces up on the screen and see if you can identify some of these betrayers, some of these uh, unbelievable people who, who committed treacherous acts. Anybody know, know who that is? Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin was uh, the Russian dictator, and under his regime, literally hundreds and thousands of people uh, died. The next one is Adolf Hitler. We know that under his leadership, obviously Nazism came into play. Uh, he began World War II. He's the one that was responsible for the genocide of 5.5 million Jews and millions of others as well. The next one, another cruel individual. Anybody know who that is? Idi Amin. Idi Amin was the president of Uganda, and underneath his leadership, he, he did an internal cleanse, an internal purge in his, in his words, and he killed more than 500,000 of the people of his own country in his mind as he was cleaning up that country. Let me show you another betrayer, see if you recognize this one. Okay, okay, okay. He probably doesn't belong in that list, right? I'm, I'm certainly not saying that he belongs in the same list with Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and all of that. But he did betray the Miami Dolphins, did he not? And he did betray the Miami Dolphins fans. I get it. That was cruel. On a serious note, uh, without a doubt, the most treacherous, the most diabolical individual who has ever lived in the history of the world, I believe is none other than Judas Iscariot. Now you would sit back and say, Brian, how is that? Because Idi Amin killed hundreds of thousands. Hitler was responsible for millions of deaths. Stalin was responsible at the very least for hundreds of thousands of deaths. And Judas Iscariot was only responsible for one death. And yet follow me today, he was responsible for the death of the only innocent, the only perfect, the only sinless man who has ever lived. And his act of betrayal, I believe, is much more egregious even than some of the worst individuals in the history of the world. And the story of his betrayal is found in the passage of Scripture that we're studying today. So if you have your phone, your iPad, your Bible, we're in Mark chapter 14. I'm going to read about 10 verses. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 43. And immediately while he was still speaking. So remember, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're picking up right where we left off last week. And he had, he had been communicating with the disciples. And, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So, so Jesus had been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, while he was praying, here comes this horde of people, religious leaders, the religious police, if you were, and they came with swords and clubs and, and weapons to detain him. Verse 44, now the betrayer 
Notice how Judas is described. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. You might sit back and say, well, wouldn't they have known who Jesus was? They'd seen him in Jerusalem. They probably had seen him perform miracles. Yeah, but but let me remind you, it was night. It was was dark in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Judas wanted to make sure that, that he was able to clearly identify who they were there to arrest. And so Judas had said, I'm going to give you a sign. The one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. Verse 45, and when he came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Think with me for just a moment of, of the level of betrayal here. Rabbi is a term of unbelievable respect. Um, Jesus was Judas's rabbi. He was the, the teacher who he had been sitting under for three and a half years. It not only was a term of respect, but it was a term of endearment for the teacher under whom they were sitting. And he looks at Jesus. He has the audacity to look at Jesus and call him rabbi. And then he leans over and he kisses him on the cheek. In Oriental times, that was, a, that was a sign of love, as it is today, a sign of love, a sign of affection, a sign of endearment, a sign of respect. So here Judas comes in, he finds Jesus, the Savior of the world, there in the garden, and, and, and he speaks to him as he would normally speak to him, and he greets him as he probably normally would greet him. Verse 46, and they laid hands on him, and they seized him. Verse 47, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. By the way, this this account is found in all four Gospels. John tells us that the man that drew the sword was Peter, and and the uh, chief priest servant who had his ear cut off was Malchus. Now, Mark doesn't tell us here, but Luke tells us in Luke's account that Jesus literally then takes whether the ear had fallen to the ground, whether it was dangling there, however it was, that Jesus reaches out and heals Malchus's ear there at that moment. Can you imagine? Here's this man who had come to arrest Jesus, literally to kill Jesus, to murder him, and how does Jesus respond? He responds with love and compassion to him. I probably would have looked at him and chopped off the other ear. He probably would have done something similar. But Jesus doesn't. He reach out, reaches out and demonstrates compassion. Verse 48, and Jesus said to them, have you come out to me as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, but you didn't seize me then. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus looks at him and said, man, you had plenty of opportunity to arrest me. I was never violent. I, I, I was always passive in my teaching. You could have arrested me in the temple. You could have arrested me anywhere. And now you come out to me with a band with clubs and swords and spears, and you arrest me like a common criminal. But Jesus says, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Verse 50 is really poignant. Verse 50, and they all left him and fled. So the disciples who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, rather than standing with Jesus at that moment, they turned and fled and ran away, leaving Jesus all alone. Verses 51 and 52 are just humorous to me. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloak about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. <laughs> I love sometimes how the, uh, the authors of the Gospels just put in incidental facts. We don't know who this man was. He was a follower of Jesus. It does demonstrate that, that the people who came to arrest Jesus were planning on arresting not only Jesus, but they were planning on arresting all of his followers as well. And so as a result, this man, as well as the other disciples, fled, leaving Jesus all alone, betrayed, by his friend, arrested, and about to stand trial. Would you pray with me today? Father, um, as we read these words, Father, these are solemn words for us. We sit back and wonder, how is it possible that someone could have betrayed the perfect son of God? 
How is it possible that someone could have done this, this, this terrible act to Jesus Christ? We understand how we can be betrayed and how others can maybe betray us, but to betray you, the one who was love embodied, the one who demonstrated nothing but kindness for Judas, the one who healed even those who came to arrest him and kill him. Father, we sit back and we read that and we, and we wonder how. We wonder why. And in our heart of hearts, we question, could we possibly be guilty of the exact same thing? So Lord, I, I pray today that you'd help us not to approach this passage with an with a air of condemnation towards Judas. But I pray that you'd help us to approach this passage with a, uh, with a spirit of submission as we allow the Holy Spirit of God to examine our actions, to examine our motives, to see if there's any way in which we could or maybe even do respond like Judas in our lives. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do a work of conviction in our hearts, in our lives. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The Bible actually tells us very little about Judas. If you were going to write a biography on him, you would find very little information in Scripture. Let me just give you a a couple of facts about Judas. They're not in your outline. But we know that his father's name was Simon. We know that. We know that he was from the town of Kerioth. You say, Brian, how do we know that? Because his name is Judas Iscariot, which means Judas of Kerioth. And so he was from a small town called Kerioth. He wasn't from Galilee like the rest of the disciples. He was from a different place. He is mentioned 20 times in the Gospels, and he's mentioned two times in the book of Acts. It's interesting, whenever you find the list of the apostles in the Gospels, he is always listed last. In every single list, he is listed last, and that's not because he was the last one chosen. I believe that that the gospel writers, as they list his name, obviously they're writing him after the fact, and it's almost like they list him as an afterthought. Here's the disciples, and oh, by the way, we have to list Judas, and he's listed last in every single list. Apart from his name, the scripture calls him three things. He's called a betrayer. He's called a traitor, and he's called the son of destruction, or depending upon your translation, maybe the son of perdition. It's interesting, as I mentioned, that this story is found throughout all four Gospels, one of the few stories that's found in the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it's found in the Gospel of John as well, and you can take some time and read that and gain truth from each of the Gospel writers. But here's what I want you to see today. So as we read this story, we're told how Judas did it. And we'll go back in just a few moments and see how he conspired with the chief priests and how he did it. We're told how he did it. We're told where he did it. He did it there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're even told when he did it. He did it just a few hours before Jesus' crucifixion. But here's what we're not told. We're not told why he did it. Why did Judas betray Jesus? There's been a lot of supposition through the years. Some would say why he was a political zealot who wanted Jesus to be this this political leader and he wanted Jesus to come in and overthrow the Romans and for him to establish his kingdom. And And when Judas saw that Jesus wasn't going down that road, at least immediately, Judas said, hey, you know what? This isn't the direction I'm going. And he betrayed Jesus. Others have said that Judas became jealous because he wasn't part of the inner circle. He wanted to be in that inner group, and as Jesus kind of isolated, as we've talked about before, Peter, James, and John, Judas wasn't in that inner circle, and he became jealous, and jealousy kind of overtook him, and he did the unthinkable. Others have suggested, and maybe the text seems to indicate it, that Judas was simply in it for the money. (laughs) When, When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, Judas saw the end coming, 
He, he realized, he was smart enough to realize that this was not going to end well. And so here's what Judas did. He cashed in all of his chips. And he said, you know what, if this is about to end, I want to get as much money out of this as I possibly can. And some suggest that it was greed that drove Judas to betray Jesus. All of those, quite frankly, are valid reasons. And maybe all three of them, to a certain degree, are true. The simple truth, though, is that we don't know why Judas betrayed Jesus. And and I'm glad Let me tell you why I'm glad, because if we knew why Judas betrayed Jesus, we could say in our heart, in our minds, we could justify ourselves, well, at least I'm not like Judas, and I don't do that. And so we could betray the Lord in other ways, but we would justify our actions saying, well, I'm not like Judas. And I think it's really interesting that the Bible doesn't completely tell us his motives. And so All of us are left with the question, could I do the same thing? Have I done the same thing? Are there ways, are there times in my life in which I have betrayed the Lord? So so here's what I want you to do today. We're going to go through and, and pull out just a couple of characteristics from Scripture of what a betrayer is what a Judas is. And I'm going to ask you to be really honest with yourself today and see whether any of these characteristics could be evident in your life. What makes a person like Judas? What actions and attitudes demonstrate our own betrayal of Jesus Christ? Because I'm here to confess to you that there's times in my life in which I have betrayed the Lord. And there's times in your life when you have as well. So so just a couple of practical thoughts that are in your notes today. The first is this. A betrayer loves other things more than Jesus. A betrayer loves other things more than Jesus. That certainly was the case with Judas. There, There are two examples in the New Testament that demonstrate the fact that Judas loved money more than he did Jesus Christ. The first is found in John chapter 12. You can turn there. I'm just going to allude to it today. But in John chapter 12, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, you're familiar with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So, so Mary, the sister of Lazarus, took this expensive perfume, and she, she, she broke it, and she opened it up, and she anointed the feet of Jesus. By the way, Jesus commends her for this tremendous act of worship. And so she breaks this perfume and she anoints the feet of Jesus. And then then the text says it seems a little weird, but it's not. It says that she dries his feet with her hair. For Mary, this was just an unbelievable act of worship. And as I mentioned, Jesus commends her saying from that time forward, everyone would know how she worshiped him. But for Judas... Judas responded differently. For Judas, it wasn't an act of worship. For Judas, very simply, it was a waste of money. John chapter 12 and verse 5 says that Judas, the other texts say that someone asked this question. John tells us who asked the question. John says that Judas says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, as you you read that verse on the surface, that seems like a legitimate complaint. After all, denarius was a day's wage of a common laborer. And so 300 denarii was almost a year's salary of a common laborer. And so you, you sit back and think, man, I get it. And Judas is sitting back saying, why would you just throw out a year's salary? You could have sold all of that. And think of all the people we could have fed. Wouldn't it be better if we could have sold that and given it to the poor? As I mentioned, as you read that, you might think, boy, this Judas guy was really socially conscious. He was really burdened about the poor. John, though, gives us a lot further insight. And John tells us what Judas's motives really were. In John chapter 12 and verse 6, John says, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because, notice how clearly John says it, because he was what? A thief. 
He was a thief. He was a robber. And they had put him in charge of the money. And being in charge of the money, he regularly what? Dipped his hand into the money and took some for himself. And so as he saw this act of worship on Jesus, he wasn't concerned about the poor. He was sitting back calculating, man, how much money could I have taken out of that 300 denarii? The second example that's found in the Gospels is found in Matthew chapter 26 and clearly demonstrates Judas' treachery because in Matthew chapter 26, Judas takes the initiative and he goes to the chief priests and he asks this diabolical question. He goes to them and he asks, how much will you give me if I hand Jesus over to you? Matthew chapter 26 is really interesting because the chief priests are surprised They are pleasantly astonished because they sit back and think, why, we never imagined that one of Jesus' own disciples would demonstrate such disloyalty. So the chief priests and Judas negotiate a price of 30 pieces of silver. Let me just pause. If you're interested in facts, there's some debate as to how much 30 pieces of silver was worth. In the Old Testament, 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave, Many scholars estimate that in New Testament times, it was worth about four months' salary. Quite frankly, it wasn't a lot of money to betray the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But as we mentioned earlier, Judas decided to cash in his chips, and at that moment, he decided to get everything he could out of that relationship. And as a result, Judas sold the Savior, the very Son of God, for a one-time lump sum cash payment of 30 pieces of silver. The psalmist prophesies that betrayal from Jesus' point of view in Psalm 41 and verse 9, where the psalmist says this, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. We read that story and we think, how treacherous. I I mean, we all know how how much it hurts to be betrayed. We all know how how much disloyalty is demonstrated in in betrayal because because you probably have been betrayed by a friend or, or maybe you betrayed a friend. And we understand how treacherous that can be. And we can look at Judas and say, how could you have done such a despicable thing? But before you're too critical of Judas, can I ask you a question today? A question that I'd like you to honestly rattle around in your mind and in your brain for just a few moments. And the question is this, very simply, has there ever been a time in which you have loved anyone or anything more than Jesus. Think about that for a second. Has there ever been a time in your life when you have loved anyone or anything more than Jesus? Maybe it's a spouse, a husband, or a wife. Maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a grandchild. Those of us who have grandchildren, we understand how, how much we love our grandchildren. Maybe like Judas, it's making money. Maybe it's a hobby. Whatever it is in your life, whatever at that moment in your life kind of demoted Jesus and you placed that object, that person, that, that feeling, whatever it was, whenever you placed that thing ahead of Jesus, at that moment, you were demonstrating disloyalty to him. And I would submit at that moment that you were betraying him as well. You said, Brian, man, those are really harsh words. Well, let me read you the words of Jesus, which are a little bit stronger than my words today. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus says this, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. 
Jesus is saying that I deserve to be loved more than anyone or anything. Jesus is saying, I deserve to occupy that place of preeminence, of prominence in your life. And when you and I love anything, a thing, a person, when we love something more than we love Jesus Christ, we are on the verge of committing the betrayal of Judas. I'm reminded of after Peter, and we'll talk about Peter in just a few moments, after Peter had denied the Lord and after the resurrection, Jesus appears to Peter in John chapter 21. He has this, this really cool dialogue with Peter in which he asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then a second time he says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asks him, do you love me more than these? And it's really interesting because in the text, the word these is ambiguous. And we don't know whether Jesus says more than these. He's talking about the other disciples, whether he's talking about the fishing equipment, whether he's talking about the boat, because Peter had gone back to fishing. We don't know what or to what or about whom the Lord was referring. But the Lord was simply asking Peter this question, do you love me more than anything or more than anyone else? And I would ask you that question today. And I've asked myself that question the last few days. Is there anyone or anything whom I love more than Jesus Christ? And if my answer is affirmative, I'm guilty of betrayal. Because Judas' betrayal began in his heart where his love for Jesus was not foremost in his heart. Let me show you a, a second thing I need to run for time's sake. The second thing is this. A, bet a betrayer is a pretender and not a possessor. A betrayer is a pretender and not a possessor. L let me say this. Judas was a phenomenal actor. Judas was a phenomenal pretender. You say, Brian, how do you know that? We look at the text, and in hindsight, we know that he was a traitor. As a matter of fact, we sit back and think, man, what was the deal with those other disciples? How could they have not caught it? Well, well, the idea very simply is this. Judas pretended, he faked, he lived it out in such a way that the rest of the disciples had no clue that he was not a legitimate follower of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 13, Jesus announces, so he's there in the upper room, and he's, he's serving the last meal of the disciples, and he announces to them, he announces to the disciples that one of them would betray him. Those disciples had no idea that the turncoat was Judas. I mean, we read that story, and we think Jesus says that, and all the disciples kind of looked over at Judas, you know, like, okay, we know it's him. But that wasn't the case at all. Nobody had a clue that it was Judas. So much so that, that just a few verses on in the text in John chapter 13, Jesus literally looks at Judas and he says, what you're going to do, you do quickly. Basically identifying, there at the table, identifying Judas as the traitor. But the disciples still didn't catch on. Verse, verse 28 of John chapter 13 says, Now no one at the table knew why he said that to him. How was it that, that Judas could have had such a traitor's heart, such a, such a betrayal heart within him, and no one knew? Man, think with me. The disciples traveled with Judas. They ate with Judas. They ministered with Judas. They even preached with Judas. Yet they had no idea that the faith Judas professed was not real. Judas was a pretender, but he was not a possessor. It's interesting to note that although Judas was able to fool the other disciples, he wasn't able to fool Jesus. Jesus knew from the very beginning the condition of his heart. You sit back and say, Brian, how do we know that Jesus wasn't even fooled? Let me show you, let me show you two verses. The first is, is a prophecy that's found in Zechariah chapter 11. 
Because hundreds of years before this betrayal, Zechariah prophesied uh, almost to the letter the exact details of Judas's betrayal. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Then it says, Then I said to them, If it seem good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the, lordly, or the worldly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Take some time and study that passage of Scripture at home because that prophecy tells us the exact price that Judas received. It prophesies that the money would be returned which Judas did. It prophesies that the money would be cast into the temple, which is exactly how Judas returned the money. And it prophesies that the money would be used to buy a potter's field, which is exactly what the chief priests did. I say all of that because Jesus knew the scriptures. He was the living word. And so when he selected Judas, he knew that he was selecting his betrayer. John chapter 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, he even says, as he's praying to the Father, he says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you had given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost. Notice what he says, except the son of destruction, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Be assured of the fact that God knew the true condition of Judas' heart. So so let me just pause there for a second and say something that we should understand, but I want to drive it home. Just as God knew the exact condition of Judas's heart, God knows your or the condition of your heart as well. And God knows the condition of my heart as well. When Israel was selecting a king, the Bible says this, man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the hearts. I think it was Abraham Lincoln who made the quote that you can fool some of the people some of the time and you can even fool all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool everybody all the time. That was a quote. When I was growing up, I had this TV program I watched called Cap and Penny, which he ended it every time. You can fool some of the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't fool mom. (laughs) And moms would get that, right? Well, the simple truth is this, church, you can fool some of the people all the time. You can fool some of us all the time, but you cannot fool Jesus. And there is a definitive difference between a pretender and a possessor. On the outside, they look the same. They worship the same. They might even know the same amount of scripture. They might know how to dress. They might know how to carry their Bible. They might know how to convey themselves in a group. But the question is not how they look on the outside. The question is this, how do they look on the inside? And at this very moment, as I look out at this well-dressed crowd, I can look out at all of you and say, man, you are a sharp-looking group, but I want you to know as I'm looking on the outside, God is looking on the inside. And God sees your heart today. You might have fooled me, you might have fooled your spouse, you might have fooled other people, but you cannot fool God. Betrayer is a pretender but a betrayer is not a possessor. Can you imagine how shocked the disciples were when they realized it was Judas who betrayed? We trusted him. We gave him the bag of money. I mean, we thought he was the most trustworthy guy in the group. Man, did he fool us. And quite frankly, one day every single one of us will stand before God. And God will look at the condition of our hearts. And God will know those who are his and those who are not his. When we teach ecclesiology, we talk about the visible church and we talk about the invisible church. The visible church is all of us who are here today. So we look out across the auditorium, several hundred people today. This is the visible church. We see the visible church. But as God looks down from heaven, he sees the invisible church. And he knows those who are his and those who are not 
lives. So let me ask you today, is your faith real? Is it real not just on Sunday morning, but is your faith real on Monday morning? Is your faith real not only when you're here at the church and you're worshiping, but is your faith real when you're going through the struggles and you're going through the battles and you're going through the difficulties? Is it real? Do you have a real, sincere, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you a possessor or are you simply a pretender? God knows the condition of your heart. Like Judas, you may be able to fool those around you. You might even fool yourself, but you cannot fool God. Let me show you a third thing that we learn from Judas. A betrayer is empowered by Satan and not by Jesus. Those are strong words. But twice in the New Testament, we are told that Satan entered into Judas. Luke chapter 22 and verse 3, and John chapter 13 and verse 27. Both of those times says that Satan entered into Judas. Now now listen, we're not saying that Judas was a believer, and as a believer he was demon-possessed. That's not what we're saying by any sense of the imagination. As a matter of fact, we would submit that Judas was not a believer. He pretended to be, but he was not a believer. I also don't want you to be deceived into thinking that Judas was not responsible for his own actions. Because some might sit back and say, oh, okay, okay, okay. So Satan entered into Judas, so whatever Judas did, it wasn't his fault, right? You know the old adage, the devil made me do it? And so Judas could sit back and say, man, I really didn't want to betray the Lord, but, but you know what? The devil made me do it. The Bible even seems to indicate that. Now, Let me show you a verse that shows you that Judas was responsible for his own actions. Acts chapter 1 and verse 25 says this, as it's talking about in the beginning of Acts how how Judas was killed and now they need to replace Judas. It makes this, this really poignant statement about Judas. It says, to take the place in this ministry, they're replacing him, an apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. What does Luke indicate in that passage? He indicates that the decision to turn aside, the decision to not embrace Jesus Christ, the decision to not believe, the decision to not have his life changed was his own decision. And he of his own volition turned aside and he chose his own route. Catch this church. Satan didn't make Judas betray the Lord. But once Judas decided on a course of action, Satan empowered him to accomplish that task. That's really powerful and it's really important. I want you to catch that. He didn't make Judas do it. But once Judas made the decision that he was walking away from God and he was going to do what was against God's perfect will, at that moment, the enemy empowered him to accomplish that task. That's scary for us. And that thing, it can be true for us. Satan does not make you do things you don't want to do. But catch this, church, once you decide to obey, once you decide to be untruthful, once you decide to get mad, once you decide to be immoral, once you decide to be dishonest, in your heart, once you choose that path, be careful. Because the enemy can empower you to accomplish his will instead of of accomplishing God's will in your life. He will empower you to do the things that God doesn't want you to do. A betrayer is empowered not by Jesus, but he's empowered by the enemy. Let me show you one last thing, and we're done today. The last thing is this. A betrayer is remorseful, but a betrayer is not repentant. A betrayer is remorseful, but a betrayer is not repentant. It's interesting, and we don't have the time to, talk in, to, to walk through the rest of the chapter, but there are actually two men who betrayed the Lord in this chapter. First is Judas, who surrendered Jesus over to arrest, and the second individual, I wish we had time to talk about it, the second was Peter who betrayed, who, who denied Jesus three different 
times. You know the story, the Lord prophesied that he was going to do it before the cock crows, before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'm willing to die for you. And guess what? Before the rooster crowed, how many times did Peter deny him? He denied the Lord three different times. An act of treason. An act of betrayal. He wouldn't even recognize that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to catch, and stick with me for just a moment. Although both committed what could be considered a treasonous act, the way they responded was completely different. Peter responded with repentance, while Judas responded with remorse. And there's a difference. I want you to see Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. Because Matthew goes through and he fleshes this out. Matthew 27, and when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. If you have an ESV, underline that phrase, he changed his mind. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and to the elders saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple. Remember the prophecy of Zechariah? Throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple. He departed and went and hanged himself. So Judas's response to his sin was to commit suicide. The, the phrase that Matthew uses, the word that Matthew uses is really interesting because if you go back where it says he changed his mind, that's a really interesting word. The, the NIV translates it this way. It says he, he, he was seized with remorse. The, the New Living Translation says he was filled with remorse. Two different words. All right, remorse and repentance. The word that is used here, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek word because I'll murder it, but the word that is used here doesn't mean actually a change of mind. It means a change of emotion. That all of a sudden Judas, man, he just wasn't into it. All of a sudden he realized, man, I probably did something wrong and his emotions changed. He was governed by his emotions. His emotions changed. He returns the the money and he goes out in an emotional spiral, and he kills himself. He demonstrated remorse in his actions, but he never demonstrated repentance. And, and I want you to catch this. I put those two phrases in your notes because I want these to, to sink into your forehead and into your heart. You say, Brian, what is the difference between remorse and repentance? There's a huge difference. The Greek words are completely different, but the practical application is completely different. Remorse is a change of attitude while repentance is a change of action. Remorse is a change of attitude, while repentance is a change in action. I want you to see a verse, and then we'll apply it and we'll be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Paul says this, For godly grief produces repentance, that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces what? Produces death. So here's what I want you to catch, and this is so applicable to our lives. A betrayer doesn't repent. A betrayer responds with remorse, not repentance. Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have looked at that. I wish I wouldn't have acted that way. I wish I wouldn't have been faithful to my husband or my wife. I wish I wouldn't have got mad. But the next day, guess what? They do the exact same thing. And they demonstrate remorse again. Man, I wish I wouldn't respond that way. Man, I wish I wouldn't act that way. I wish I wouldn't treat my wife that way. And they commit the same offense over and over again. And they always respond with remorse. There's this emotional grief over what they did. But they do not respond with repentance. And you say, Brian, why is that? Because repentance produces a change of action. Repentance causes me to turn from my sin and to turn towards Jesus Christ. Repentance causes me to change my actions, those sinful actions which have ruled me, which have governed me. When I truly repent of my sin, I turn from them and I turn towards Jesus. And little by little, Jesus changes me. Judas responded with remorse. But Peter 
responded with repentance. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Well, read the last chapter of John and read the first two chapters of the book of Acts because we see a brand new Peter. We see a Peter whose life is changed, a Peter who now becomes the leader of the church. And he preaches that great sermon in Acts chapter 2 in which thousands of people come to Christ. Judas, on the other hand, goes out filled with remorse. And instead of going to Jesus and repenting and asking for forgiveness, he hangs himself. Worldly grief results in death. Godly grief results in repentance, which produces salvation. So let me ask you today, is there an action in your life that is a demonstration of betrayal to your Savior? Is there something that you do on a regular basis? Man, you feel bad about it. It's not like you have this callous heart. You don't feel bad about it. You feel bad about it, but, but you find yourself doing the same thing over and over and over again. Let me encourage you today, don't be like Judas. Let me encourage you today, respond like Peter. Respond with true repentance and confess that sin and reach out to Jesus who is the only remedy to change those actions in your life. See, 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 here's my supposition today. We can look at Judas and say, most despicable man in the world, so unlike us, it's unbelievable. Or we can look at Judas and say, there's a little bit of Judas in me. I am equally capable of betraying the Savior. There's times that I love others more than I love Jesus Christ, and I don't want to do that. There's times that I'm remorseful, but I'm just not repentant. Would you allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart today? And if God places his finger on an area of your life, would you confess it? Would you repent? And would you allow God to change you, to do a Peter transformation in your life.